Welcome to this CTSNet video on echo interpretation. I'm, my name's Joel Dunning. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with, uh, with uh, uh, Adamola Abiosi uh, from the North Ohio uh, Heart Center. Ade, uh, welcome. Oh, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Joel. My name is Ademola Abiosi. I am a consultant cardiologist with North Ohio Heart. The goal did today is to talk about uh, uh, echo applications with uh, slant towards surgeons and uh, the usefulness and applications of basic echo and TEE for surgeons. So the you know the early valve, just like the mitral valve, is not just the valve. It, you know it's got uh, a fibrous analogs. There's a sinotubular junction, the sinus of alpha, and then the the actual leaflets. And so you can see here, there, there's the sinotubular junction here. This is the non-coronary cause. There's the right coronary cause, and this is the left coronary cause. Um, so the commonest things that we deal with, of course, is valvular aortic stenosis. Uh, most of the time in patients that are older than 70 years is due to senile degeneration. Uh, but if you have younger patients, it might be due to bicuspid aortic valve. Rheumatic aortic valve is very, very uncommon as a primary cause of aortic stenosis. If you see that, you should always check the mitral valve. Um, so, um, Calcification resembles ectopic, ectopic bone formation. And in fact, um, risk factors for calcific aortic stenosis is similar to those for atherosclerosis with lipid accumulation, inflammation, and calcification. So, you know, we advise patients about general risk factor modification, stop smoking, get your cholesterol down, control hypertension. Okay. Bicuspid aortic valve is the most common congenital anomaly about one to two percent of all life births. Uh, it's actually, you know, some. Uh, there's some data to suggest that it might be familiar, but autosomal dominant with a very low penetrance. Okay. Uh, the commissures may be horizontal or vertical. It's not, it's, it, it's, we're beginning to realize that it's a form of valvulopathy. It's not just the valve. So it's associated with proximal aortic abnormalities. And uh, when you see it, you should always try and rule out coarctation of the aorta or dilatation of mm -hmm. the uh, aorta. Uh, echo and can this do that. This is very different to if you read on a report functionally by a cuspid valve. A congenitally by cuspid is very different, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm talking about the congenital. Yeah, yeah yes, correct. Because if you have a, you're right, that's a good point. If you have a functional uh, by cuspid valve, then, then you don't have all these other associated on the mouth. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a tricuspid valve that's just got stuck. <laughs> exactly, right, correct, correct. Um, you know, it's usually uh, maybe mildly regurgitant. Um, how do we, um, as you know, I'll just go and talk about quickly how we just uh, determine the severity of the uh, aortic stenosis. It's the same concept of conservation of mass. What goes in must come out. So if we have to the left of the equation, you're going to have the uh, LVOT uh, and the velocity of the LVOT, which we can determine by. Uh, by uh, Doppler on echo. And this is the stenotic valve here. And then the velocity of uh, the gradient across the valve, we can get that. So A1, V1 is equal to A2 and V2. So by rearranging that equation here, uh, we can get the uh, aortic valve area. So, you know, it's standard uh, because we can always get our gradients using the 4V square to get the gradients across the uh, uh, aortic valve. And we can rearrange that equation it's in the Golding formula of echocardiography. So remember, conservation of mass, uh, flow across a stenotic or regurgitant orifice is the same as the proximal flow uh, across a known area on the left side. So very simple concept. Uh, using that, I won't go into this because this just shows you how we derive the simple Bernoulli equation. Um, you know, usually is the uh, uh, the pressure across the aortic valve minus the pressure across the LVOT, that is the uh, differential pressure. But basically, it boils down to 4V squared. Okay? Uh, I think we'll spare the sur surgeons this, this particular headache. <laughs> um, so the uh, other way to measure the severity is to actually plenimeter the valve. Uh, for the same reason that we talked about for the mitral valve, sometimes it's difficult to, to uh, to see the opening very well. Uh, and because the opening is also somewhat flow dependent, it's difficult to distinguish uh, decreased opening due to left ventricular failure. 
uh, TEE is, is more superior. And of, of course, you know, the curve is almost always calcified and dense calcification reduces the accuracy of uh, training metric. Um, we, we talked about the predictors of survival for mitral regurgitation, remember the uh, ERO. So for, for aortic stenosis, the single most important uh, predictor uh, for survival that we have is the velocity across the valve. And this study, um, landmark study by uh, Catherine Otto, showed that uh, the survival for patients where the velocity is more than uh, four meters per second, uh, the survival at two years, uh, if they don't have uh, aortic valve replacement, um, is markedly increased, 84% compared to 21% if it's less than four meters per second. So very simple measurement, just measuring the peak velocity, and if it's more than four meters per second, suggests that this patient may not do well. All right, and uh, what about aortic regurgitation? The same concept for mitral regurgitation, uh, the size of the jet in relation to the uh, diameter, so the jet ratio to if it's less than 25% is mild. And you can see this is filling the whole extent of the LVOT. So this is obviously wide open um, aortic regurgitation. Okay. For well, aortic regurgitation, you know, it's not as extensive as mitral, as mitral regurgitation. You know, the ERO is not well, well, it's not robust as, as for mitral regurgitation. So we tend to use more of the uh, pressure half time, uh, which is the same concept uh, to mitral stenosis. It's just that it's the opposite. In uh, aortic regurgitation, you want the pressure half time to be long, okay? If you have something to the right like this, where you have a sharp deceleration, that is acute aortic regurgitation, and the patient generally do not tolerate this very well because the ventricle has not had enough time to dilate to cope with that regurgitant jet. So here in aortic regurgitation, a long pressure half time is a good thing, okay? So if pressure half time is more than 400 milliseconds, that is mild aortic regurgitation. If it's less than 250, and that is severe aortic regurgitation. Anything in between is, um, is uh, moderate. There's also something that we look for, like in the uh, aorta, either the abdominal aorta or the uh, ascending aorta, we can look for flow reversal. That shows us that the jet is so severe that it's getting reversed in the uh, descending aorta. The echo version of pistol shot femorals and all those other signs you learn as a student. Yes, yes, all those signs that we learn. Yeah, that is correct. So, you know, the severity of uh, aortic regurgitation, these are things that we use. These are some of the numbers that we use to guide us uh, in terms of the severity of the aortic regurgitation. You can calculate the effective regurgitant area, which I won't go into the details, but it's also the same conservation of mass. Uh, in that case, you're going to use the mitral and the aortic valve to say that what goes in must come out. So you rearrange the equation and then you'll be able to get the um, uh, effective regurgitant orifice area. All right, so just a few other things in terms of that would might interest the surgeon is the left atrial appendage. You know, that um, when you're doing your MACE procedure and you want to oversaw the left atrial appendage, that is what it looks like, it's like a call de sac. We look for thrombus in the left trap. And that small hole here is the uh, left circumflex in short axis, that black hole. Let's stop it. Right, right here. Yeah. yeah, that is the left circumflex in short axis um, on the TEE. Also, in the atrial septum, uh, you know, you're doing your ASD repair of PFO and stuff like that. That's how we look for the interatrial septum. You can see it. this looks small. You can see there's a flow that is going from left to right. Um, in this case. Um, so, you know, in that case, sometimes when you have that kind of flow, even if you do bubble study, uh, the bubble study may be negative. So the only way we're able to tell is because of the color flow that shows us that there's actually a flow from left to right in this patient. But, but is a bubble study not the most sensitive way to find a it PFO? Is. It is, but that for a, for a PFO, but you know, if you have a negative bubble study, it doesn't necessarily rule out. Uh, because what you can see here, it looks like a tunnel PFO. 
um, that is mm -hmm. actually giving like a left to right shunt. This view is uh, by cable view. You can see uh, the IVC will be to, uh, to your left, the SVC will be to the right. On this view, we also, it's going to be uh, important when you're dealing with ASD, especially if you're looking for other types of ASD, apart from the secondum ASD, uh, like the uh, sinus venosus ASD, uh, to get this view and rule out any anomalous uh, pulmonary venous drainage. The forgotten ventricle, that's what we call it, but it's becoming more and more important. The right ventricle, so the TE also helps us to assess our right ventricular uh, function, um, estimate the uh, right-sided pressures, uh, rule out significant pulmonary hypertension, especially before you go for surgery, you don't want to be surprised and do all this excellent and uh, hard work and find out that the RV, <laughs> you know, fails post-operatively because you didn't know there was RV function. So that's why we call it the faculty ventricle. We should always, so this is some of the things that we before the patients go for surgery. And uh, that's the color, uh, the right ventricle to evaluate for uh, TR jets. Just to answer your question about the left ventricle, uh, the 3D TEE helps us to take multiple views of the uh, left ventricle with biplane imaging. So you can have images that are 90 degrees uh, from each other on the same screen. And then this is what it looks like. So you have your four chamber and you have the two chamber because you have their orthogonal uh, planes. And that, uh, that is what 3D has provided for us. And then with that, we can actually get uh, 3D quantification of the uh, left ventricular systolic function. Um, so this is 3D imaging. You know, we just uh, put the cursor there. We press live 3D, okay, and we adjust the gain and TGC. And then you hit a button that, that's called full volume. And then with that, you accept this full volume. And then you can go back and just do all sorts of stuff with that. You can quantify the level and color systolic function. You can crop the images whichever way you want. And, uh, you know, it's like a little toy that you can play with. <laughs> But you can get a much yeah. better estimate of ejection fraction percentage. That is saying. absolutely correct, yes. And I will show you that on the next slide here. So yeah. that cartoon was just showing you how we acquire. You can see that we're acquiring over multiple cardiac cycles. That is what the 3D looks like with the uh, full volume. And then we can go back and... Uh, and uh, quantify our LV function, you know, do cropping and all sorts of things with that. Okay. All right. So this is um, estimation of the, um, it's automated. You don't even need to do a lot of stuff, you know. So you might just need to uh, identify the plane of the uh, mitral uh, analogs. And then the computer does the rest of the work for you. It gets the uh, ventricle in four chamber, in two chamber as well as in short axis. And it ger generates this uh, cone here that gives you an estimate of the LV systolic function, which has been shown to actually be superior, almost as good as uh, cardiac camera in estimating the level to our systolic function. Okay. And if you just get a standard 2D echo, that is just a two dimensional guess of ejection fraction, and that is quite inaccurate, isn't it? It, well, it, it, it is, but that, that was what we had. I would not say it's quite inaccurate because when we do that, even with the 2D, we do it both uh, in four chamber as well as two chamber. Okay, there's something that we call modified Simpsons. Uh, that is a series of cones. You know, it, it just it's yeah. just standardized. But the beauty of this is that this is doing everything simultaneously. It's doing the four, uh, the four chamber, the two chamber, as well as the short axis view. And so it, it puts all this information together in real time to give you an estimate of the um, of the of the uh, LV function, which is uh, superior, uh, and it's almost as good as uh, doing it with the gold standard, which is the um, which is cardiac MRI. Another thing that we don't lose sight of when we do TEE is to look at the error. Uh, you know, patients are gonna get bypass; they're gonna get cross clamp across the aorta, you need to let the surgeon know if there's significant, you know, plaque body in that aorta so that they will know that, uh, you know, if the patient has uh, 
some uh, uh, cerebral events uh, after surgery, uh, that's something to be prepared for. So we look at the other body, short, short axis and the long axis, and then we're able to quantify the degree of a black body uh, in those patients. Um, don't, this is the last series of uh, uh, images. That is the, the transgastric views of the left ventricle. Remember, we talked about looking at the left ventricle at the level of the mitral valve, as well as the papillary muscle. So we can get them uh, those two views in short axis as well as uh, in long axis of the left ventricle uh, with the 3D. This is obviously at the level of the mitral valve. Uh, that's the basal short axis. This is all TEE. Now, remember we showed this at the beginning with the regular echo. Now this is TEE at the base of the uh, of the valve. And also, we also look at the right ventricle. This is the right ventricular inflow, the tricuspid valve. This is all TEE. The uh, deep transgastric view is what we uh, use for estimating uh, aortic stenosis uh, intra or postoperatively, you know, after the valve has been replaced, because this enables us to be able to line up the, the, the cursor that is going to be parallel to the left ventricular outflow tract. So you can get a very good and accurate gradient across the aortic valve. So that is advancing the TEE probe a little bit deeper. This is very easy to do when the patient is in the OR. It's very uncomfortable uh, if we're just doing it uh, pre-op because you really need to advance the probe and get this. But if the patient is in the OR and it's already uh, under anesthesia, you can advance your probe uh, and get this uh, view very easily. And this next slide shows you what it looks like. This was before the valve was replaced. This was the, uh, the velocity and the gradient across the aortic valve before uh, aortic valve replacement. You can see the peak velocity is like four, four meters per second right here. And then after valve implantation, the velocity is uh, almost uh, markedly reduced. Okay. The main gradient, three. yeah, the main gradient is like six millimeters of mercury. Yeah, yeah. You're right. So, so that's what we get with that. Uh, we're able to get this with that deep uh, transgastric view. And I think uh, that this is the end of our discussion. Once again, I would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, assistance of uh, Lisa for uh, all her support and providing uh, all these uh, beautiful images that we just talked about. She's the director of the Yale Echo Lab and uh, my Echo Mentor. At the, uh... Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much from myself, Joel Dunning, and everyone at CTSNet. It's been very useful. And uh, thank you very much for going through that. That was fabulous. Okay. Thank you, Joel. It's my pleasure.